Welcome everyone to Business Garage. If you've just tuned in, you are right on time. All right, we continue with our series called Rebuilding Businesses. Every week for so many weeks now, we've brought you stories of people in business who have, who have brought you a story of transformation, their story of pain and recovery, you know, sharing mistakes they've made, successes they've had. And today we have a very unique opportunity to sit with someone who is not necessarily a business owner in that capacity today, but comes to talk about a pertinent issue that many of us who are in business and intend to get into business need a lot of knowledge about. So today we bring you one of the leading tax consultants here in our city, at least in our opinion, Mr. Joseph Okucha. You are most welcome. Woohoo! Thank you so much for joining us. Let's check if that microphone is on there. Woohoo! So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. We are super excited to host you. Now, we have so many business people watching today and also potential business owners, aspiring, expiring, hopefully not. Uh, but but lot, lots of people have so many questions. And guys, as always, we want you to engage on social media. All right. Ask questions. This is just start thinking about what do you want to know about tax we will be able to answer those questions. But before we get into that, I just want to let the people get acquainted with you. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Joseph? What do you do uh, throughout the week? What do you spend your time doing to make some kamani? Thank you so much. Uh, my, name, my name is Joseph Patrick Alfred. Hey. Onyala Cheng. Hey. Okuja. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, that is the trend now because uh, we are in that era where we are supposed to use the names that appear on our academic papers. So if you look at my academic papers, you'll find Joseph Patrick Alfred no Onyala. Way. But today I am known as Joseph O. Okuja. Ah. But most people know me as OJ. So oh. that is who I am. Oh, we yes. like it. <laughs> I am married to a beautiful lady by names of Dora Kemirimo. She's Okuja. in the house. She's present. And uh, I currently practice my trade as a tax consultant at Libra Advocates and Consultants. It is a law firm. We are located on the second floor of AHA Towers, and we basically provide tax and legal services to both individuals and non-individuals who require that kind of service. Um, what more do you want to know about me? Is this a tax Bible? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I always move around with what I call my tax Bible. It is a publication of mine. It wow. is titled Domestic and International Taxation in Uganda. And each and everything you need to know about taxation in Uganda and generally in the world is covered in this book. And that is why I move with it wherever I go. But of course, as far as I'm concerned, I know whatever is in this book. <laughs> so it's about a thousand pages. And I think uh, the next edition may have about 1,300 pages. Because the tax laws are amended every year and new changes come in. So I keep updating it. So the next edition will probably have about 1,300 pages. So it is available. You can get it in a restock. I think it costs about 200,000 at a restock. Only. But if you get it from me, you can get it at 165,000 shillings. Oh. Only. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Uh, please pray for me. <laughs> When you're sitting near such an intellectual giant to so say, these pages are in your book, in your head, sir. Yes. Yeah, yes. it's okay. Uh, for me, I'm here to just ask the questions of the regular Ugandan. Uh, but it's such an honor, seriously, though, to, to be able to have an audience with someone with so much knowledge around taxation. So just to ask, how did your journey begin? Because by the time a man is able to write... <laughs> 
the equivalent of a Bible. <laughs> Where did your journey begin? In terms of, were you always passionate about taxation? Where did this passion for tax, uh, you know, for informing and helping people concerning taxation come from? Because for many of us in Uganda, there's one lack of knowledge, but also a certain, I don't know what the word is, a negativity towards the whole issue of taxation. And maybe it comes also from lack of knowledge. So where did this come from? Where does your journey begin in this area? So I, it was never ever my dream to be a tax practitioner or tax consultant for that matter. Actually, my first job was that of a mechanic. So I was, I was a mechanic at some point in time, and that is why I'm very passionate about vehicles. And when I take my car for servicing or when it goes for repair, I basically know what needs to be done. So that was my first job. But before I did that job, I had intended to become a priest. So all my primary life, primary and secondary, I was in the seminary training to become a priest. Uh, but for one or other reason... Then you met Dora? No. <laughs> Dora comes in the picture much, much later. So I started off as a, a mechanic, and then my first job was a banking assistant in Crane Bank when it had just started. I was in Crane Bank for about three months or so. <laughs> and uh, from Crane Bank... I joined the immigration department. I was uh, trained to be an immigration official. And after the training, when we had been posted, actually I was posted to Swam River Border Post, that one is in Kapchorwa. Uh, immediately after that posting, I received my invitation to join URA. That was way back in 1996. So I joined URA in 96, and of course the first two years, that time was strictly for studying. So you were trained in financial accounting, you were trained in tax law. And that is basically the knowledge I got as far as financial accounting is concerned and as far as the tax law is concerned. So that journey of being who I am today started way back in 1996. Wow. And... Um, like everybody who joins URA, the work in URA is routine. You are more or less doing the same thing day in and day out. Yeah. And therefore, to gain the kind of competence that you require, you need to put personal effort mm -hmm. into study. So 1996 up to 2005, I was basically a tax auditor in URA. Wow. And I was very good at tax auditing. I actually won several awards for being the best tax auditor while in URA. Then it was in 2005, during the restructuring exercise, when uh, Madam Alien Kajina became the Commissioner General, and we were all sacked and asked to re reapply yes. for our jobs. So at that point in time, I applied to be the supervisor in charge of audit quality assurance. But then... I didn't have the qualifications that they wanted. They wanted someone who was qualified accountant, someone who had SCCA, and I didn't have that qualification. But nonetheless, I applied for that particular position. And when we went for the interview, I was challenged. What makes you think you can do this job? This yeah. is a job for a certified accountant. accountant. Yeah. This is a job for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. What makes you think you can do it? And I told the interview panel at that time, that I did not need to be an accountant or, an, or a lawyer because the amount of knowledge I have is sufficient for me to perform the duties for which I had applied. Mm -hmm. The interview actually ended very badly because I walked out <laughs> of that particular interview. I knew I didn't have a job after that because one of the members on the panel belittled me and called me a liar because I had told him that... Uh, I actually did SCCA for about a year and then dropped out because I thought it was not adding value to my life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said I was lying and that you, you can't call me a liar. 
So I banged the table and I walked out of that interview <laughs> knowing I have no job in URA. But by God's grace, I was appointed and given that position. <laughs> yes. So when I got that position, I now took it upon myself to prove to them yes. that I can be better than anybody they thought was entitled to do that job. And so my first task when I became the supervisor in charge of audit quality assurance was to compile the compendium of the domestic tax laws which all taxpayers are using up to today. So I had to retype the law word for word. Actually, that, was, that is the time I bought my first computer. I bought my computer and I decided to retype the laws word for word, incorporating all the amendments that had been made up to 2005. Now, of course, today we're in a digital world and you can find these documents online or wherever you want to get them. But at that time, it was very difficult to get hold of any soft copy of a document. And that is why I had to type it word for word. <laughs> so by typing word for word, I got to understand each and every provision that exists in the tax laws. And that is how my journey in compiling this particular book started. Two, I also took it upon myself to ensure that URA has documented procedures. So I started documenting procedures that URA, rather the auditors would use for purposes of conducting tax audits. And through the process of documenting all, that, all the procedures, I finally came out with this particular book because it contains most of the guidance and procedures that I used to give to URA staff because I was in charge of audit quality assurance. So when I finally left URA, that was in 2011, I decided to put all that information into this particular book, and that is how we arrive at where we are. So overall, I was with URA for three terms. That's about 15 years. Like a president. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> three terms. And then uh, by 2011, I felt I was not adding any more value to URA. And I thought I needed to get out and provide value to the taxpayers. And that is when I left URA. I joined Grant Thornton as their director, tax and legal services. I was with Grant Thornton for about for four years, actually. And then I linked up with some two young lawyers to start the law practice. And that is how I get to where I am today as the tax lead at Libra Advocates and Consultants. Thank you. First of all, I feel like we need to bring you back just to hear the story because they're like so, there's so much wisdom and story in between to this point, but what a story. I guess the question I want to ask you who is watching, are you adding value where you are or you've stopped adding value and it's time to find a place to add value, but also are you so confident in the value you bring that you can walk out of the interview and still be hired? Come on, yeah? So that is such a challenge to us. But now, I mean, today we really want to talk about, if you could tell us about some of the key tax issues that people in business, you would say that they need to pay attention to or to know about. Like if you are meeting a person who is new to business and you are speaking to them and saying, hey, these are some of the key things in taxation that I would, I would say you need to pay attention to and why should they pay attention to those issues? Thank you so much. So whether you're in business or you're not in business, yeah. you are a taxpayer. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So the first thing that any person needs to understand is that the tax structure in Uganda and basically in any other part of the world today is built on a system of self-assessment. Now self-assessment basically means that we have a law that has been enacted by parliament that imposes different kinds of taxes. And that is all the law does. It imposes a tax. But the obligation to comply with the requirements of the law is left to the individual. Okay? Mm. 
That is what self-assessment means. The first obligation is on you as an individual, either in employment or in business, to voluntarily comply with your tax obligations. URA only comes into the picture when you fail to voluntarily <laughs> comply. Okay? So that is the first thing that you need to know. So what does voluntary compliance mean? Yeah. Number one, it means that you have to register as a taxpayer. Now, registration as a taxpayer depends on the kind of activities you are involved in for purposes of earning a living. Now, <clears throat> we have two broad categories of tax, and those two categories basically define how we are taxed. We have all heard about direct and indirect taxes. Uh -huh. A direct tax is a tax that is imposed on your income mm -hmm. as a person. Okay? That is what makes it direct. It is imposed directly on your income as a person. Now, a person may be an individual, that is a natural person, or a company, that is a legal person. So both categories are affected. So once you derive any income, then you are required to register for taxes. So that is what is called a direct tax. Mm -hmm. You are taxed when you earn income. What is income? Income is money <laughs> or anything that can be converted into money. Oh. That is income. So what determines your liability to tax is a question of whether you have derived that income as a result of a profit motive or not. So for example, if I give this book to be, like I'm going to do after this show. <laughs> okay? This book, like I said, costs 200,000 shillings. So when I give it to her, mm -hmm. she will have earned income equivalent to 200,000. Wow. Okay? Mm. And that income is supposed to be accounted by her. Yes. As her income. Okay? Now, if I give it to her, in a business relationship. Say, for example, I owe her 200,000 uh -huh. and I don't have the cash, but I decide to pay her using this book. Mm. Then that amounts to income, income that is liable to tax. But if I give it to her as a gift, then the tax law exempts gifts from taxation. taxation. So she will have earned income equivalent to 200,000, but she is not liable to tax on that particular income. So that is what a direct tax is. So as long as you receive money or anything that can be converted into money, then you have derived income that may be liable to tax. So the first level of taxation is when you earn. The second level of taxation is when you consume. Mm. Okay? <laughs> so whenever you consume any good or service, you also pay tax. And now that is the tax that is called indirect because mm. the tax is not imposed on you who is consuming. Mm. The tax is, is imposed on the goods or the services that you are consuming as a person. So those are the two broad categories of taxes. And that is how we are taxed. When we earn and when we spend money. So at both levels, you are taxed and you cannot avoid taxation. Yeah. As long as you earn and as long as you spend, you will be, paying, you will be liable to tax. So, having looked at those two broad categories of taxes, we now go into the different types of taxes that exist. So, the most common one that we all know is what we call the income tax. Yeah. Now, an income tax is imposed on any person who derives income from three major sources. Mm -hmm. You should be deriving income either from business, <coughs> that is you are selling goods and services in order to earn money, or you can derive income from employment. And employment strictly applies to individuals. So if you are employed, you earn a salary, and that salary constitutes your income, and you are taxed as an employee. The third category 
is the income that you earn from investments. Mm. So once you invest, you earn income, and that income is taxable. So those are the three broad categories of activities that we, as people, can engage in. You either engage in a business, you are employed, or you invest and you earn from your investment. So that is what constitutes the basis for income taxation. The other tax that we know of is what they call the VAT, mm -hmm. which is an indirect tax. That is a tax that is imposed on taxable goods and, and services. services. So as long as you consume a good that is taxable or a service that is taxable, you are going to be charged VAT. Now VAT only applies if you are charged by a person who is VAT registered. Not anybody can charge VAT. You must be VAT registered in order to pay VAT. Okay? Rather, in order to charge VAT. But of course, we have many individuals and businesses out there that charge VAT when they are not registered to charge VAT. Now, as a consumer, it is your obligation to find out whether the person who has charged you VAT is actually VAT registered. Mm -hmm. If you do not do that, then you are merely paying an amount over and above oh what you ought to be paying. Why? Because that person who has charged you is not going to account for that mm -hmm. revenue to URA. So whenever you go to buy any goods or services and somebody is charging you VAT, yeah. you must make an effort to find out whether that person is VAT registered or not. If they are not VAT registered, then you shouldn't pay whatever VAT they charge. You have to pay them exclusive of the VAT. Now that applies to all goods and services that you consume and are taxable. The other kind of tax that applies to us is what they call an excise duty. Now an excise duty is a tax that is imposed on certain categories of goods that are either imported into the country or they are manufactured within the country. Things like beer, water, soda, cement, those are the kinds of goods that attract excise duty. Mm. So whenever you buy any of those goods, you are actually paying excise duty. So the manufacturer or the supplier will sell the goods to you, and those amounts include the excise duty that you pay. Another kind of tax that we pay is what they call stamp duty. Now, stamp duty is a tax that you are supposed to pay on any document that you append your signature to. If you append your signature to any document, and that document grants you certain rights or imposes certain obligations on you, then that document becomes liable for stamp duty. The minimum amount currently is 15000 per document. Okay? People are evading so much tax. <laughs> yes, and like, it happens because, like I said, the system is based on self-assessment. Yes. It is up to you to make a declaration to URA. <laughs> now, when you don't, and URA comes and finds out that you actually earned income, but you did not declare the income, that you are actually employed, but your employer is not withholding pay as you earn, then that is when you become liable and URA is going to issue assessments against you. So stamp duty is a tax that we are supposed to pay for all value documents that we append our signatures to. Now the catch is, while URA may not come chasing after you to ensure that you have paid stamp duty on all the documents that you have appended your signature to, should you ever get into trouble and you need to use that document as evidence in court, that is when you will be caught. <laughs> because any document on which stamp duty has not been paid is not admissible as evidence in court. And that is where you'll actually be caught and you'll be required to go to URA, pay the stamp duty, and have it brought back to court. Of course, that only happens if 
the lawyers know that this particular document hasn't paid stamp duty. And if they raise up the issue, but if they keep quiet about it, then court will normally proceed and ignore that. Finally, we have, of course, the international taxes on trade. Those are the customs duties. Whenever you import any goods into the country, you are liable for customs duty. And uh, that is normally imposed at the rate of 0% for raw materials and machinery, 10% for intermediate goods or semi-finished goods, and then 25% for finished goods. So th basically, those are the taxes that we are liable to as citizens of this country. Wow. Like, just as you're speaking, there's so much ignorance being dispelled. You know, like people are seeing how, how much tax they've evaded. And it's not because, it's not because people are actually in, in that thing you're saying, if it's self-assessment, then there's a lack of knowledge. Of course, you're going to end up making mistakes. There's a question I've already seen online before I asked the one I was going to ask. That from what you already said, that people are asking, I think Mugisa Richard is saying, when I earn a salary, I pay tax. That same salary, I get some of the money and I invest it, then I'm asked to, the taxes, are, you know, are on the investment. Isn't that like double taxation? You know, that's a question. That's a very common question <laughs> that is asked. And we being double taxed or yeah. even triple taxed. Mm -hmm. Now, the concept of double taxation only applies if and when the same income is taxed in the hands of the same person. Ah. That is when double taxation occurs. That the same income that I have earned is taxed on me twice. Yes. Okay? Now, double taxation will normally apply, say, for example, in cases where you have a person who is tax resident in Uganda, okay? But that person also has a business in Kenya. Uh -huh. Now, as a general principle, every country taxes its citizens on the basis of whether you are resident or non-resident. Mm -hmm. If you are tax resident in Uganda, okay, you are taxed on your worldwide income that is the income you derive from any part of the world wow. as long as you are tax resident in uganda. uganda for individuals you are considered tax resident if your home is in uganda mm -hmm. so most of us of course are tax resident because we have a home in uganda for the foreigners for the expatriates they become tax resident in uganda if they are present in uganda for a minimum of six months. <laughs> so if, a, if an expatriate comes in and they are present in Uganda for six months, then they qualify to be tax, tax resident. resident. If they are here for less than six months, they remain non-resident individuals. Okay? Now, because of the various schemes that people adapt to avoid taxes, the law also provides that if you are present in Uganda, over a period of three years, and in each of those three years, you are present for a minimum of at least three months in each of those years, then you qualify to be tax resident in Uganda. <laughs> and therefore, you become liable to tax on your worldwide income. So, assuming I'm a resident of Uganda, I am earning income from my tax consultants in Uganda which I'm expected to declare to URA and pay tax. If I also earn consultancy income from Kenya, Kenya has the first right to tax me on the income and within its borders. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Now, if Kenya tax me, taxes me on that income, and yet Uganda expects me to declare the income I have earned in Uganda plus the income I have earned in Kenya, and also taxes me, that is when the question of double taxation arises. Because the same income is being taxed in the hands of the same person. Otherwise, when you earn and you spend, you are not being taxed double. Wow. Yes. Yeah, the brain is expanding today. I mean, I'm seeing so many questions online. The truth is that we're not going to answer all your questions. 
And that's why you need to buy the tax Bible. It's in a restock. Yes, go buy the taxation Bible, read it, get acquainted seriously, because there's so much wisdom, knowledge, help for us to be able to be responsible citizens of this nation and add to its value. And thankfully, someone has put it together for us. Things that they have learned over the years are available in one book that you can go and purchase for your business and for your person just to be able to be well acquainted with this. I have one more question for you, which is like double-edged. You know, the question about what are some of the legal and right ways to reduce the tax burden, especially for the business owner? What are some of the, the things that, that, you know, you would throw out? I mean, we have only five minutes to say, eh, eh, sorry? The, yeah, like, you know, what are, the, what are some of the things that are legal and right? And also, if you could then also touch on why should someone be excited to be participating in paying taxes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the last part of your question. <laughs> Now, of course, I have always heard that we pay taxes so that government can provide us public goods and services. Yeah, in school. Uh, that is not entirely true because <laughs> taxation is not what they call a quid pro quo, that you pay taxes in order to receive something back. No. No. We pay taxes to finance government expenditures. <laughs> both recurrent and development expenditure. That is the purpose why you pay taxes. And that is why it becomes important that when you go to vote your leaders, you vote leaders who are going to ensure that they prioritize expenditures that benefit the common person. If you vote leaders that are going to steal the money, that are going to use it for projects that do not benefit the common person, then you will never benefit. So we pay tax to finance government, government expenditures. expenditures. So if you have an extravagant government, nothing will trickle down to the common person. So that is the reason we pay tax. It is not a quid pro quo. You say that because I have paid, I expect government to build this road. I expect government to provide drugs in hospitals. Yes, that is an expectation, but it is not a given. <laughs> okay? So... As a person who is liable to tax, I think the first thing you need to do is to be compliant. That is the first and legal method of avoiding taxation. Oh. <laughs> compliance, compliance, compliance. And what does compliance mean? Now, if you are in business, it is very important for you to understand under what kind of structure you're operating. Are you operating as a company? Because the rules and the rates of taxes are different for companies. Are you operating as an individual, a sole proprietor? The rules and rates for individuals are different. So that is the first consideration. How am I earning my income? Now, if you are operating as an individual, of course, we all know that individuals derive income under two categories, either from business or from employment. If you are in employment, the tax law takes away the obligation to comply from the individual who is in employment as long as the employer has withheld pay as you earn and remitted that amount to URA. That individual who is in employment has no other tax obligation because the obligation has been transferred to the employer. However, if the employer, for one reason or another, does not withhold pay as you earn, then you, still become, you remain liable as an individual to file a return at the end of the year and declare the pay as you earn that your employer should have declared. So just because the obligation is put on the employer does not mean the, the individual is now exempted from taxes. You're only exempted if your employer has complied. So employment, of course, is a very easy way of earning income, but it is also the most highly taxed because as an employee, you are going to pay tax at 30% of whatever income you earn, yeah. irrespective of 
any other expenditures you may incur to earn that particular income. But if you are an individual who is in business, then you are allowed to deduct all the expenses you incur in order to earn that income, and you only pay tax on the profit that you make. So if you make no profit, then you do not pay any tax. Now, for individuals and companies, there's a category of taxpayers who are known as the presumptive taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the small taxpayers who are earning income between zero and 150 million. If you fall in that category, you are a small taxpayer <laughs> and you pay taxes on the basis of how much turnover or how much income you have earned over the year. If you earn below 10 million shillings as an individual in business, you are not liable to any tax in Uganda. Wow. But as an employee, you are liable to tax at 30%. So you are better off in business than in employment. <laughs> and then wow. above, above 10 million the tax is graduated. You'll pay between 10 and 20 million per annum, you'll pay 100,000 shillings only. 20 to 30 million, you'll pay 200,000. So the rates are graduated and they're really fair. It is meant to cater for people who earn less than 150 million. So that is very, very important. Now, in order for you to minimize your tax liabilities, like I said, just comply. Compliance means you register for taxes, and once you register for taxes, you must comply with the obligations to file a return. If you don't file a return at the end of the month or at the end of the year, then the URA is going to issue what they call <laughs> estimated assessments. Oh, sure. okay? And that is going to eat into your income. But once you file your returns, then whatever amount you declare is what is considered as your tax for that particular period. So it is very important that you comply. Of course, there are a number of incentives that exist within the laws that you can take advantage of, both for employers and for persons in business. I cannot go into the yeah, details, yeah. but the number of incentives that you can benefit from. Get hold of this exactly. book. You will find all the tax planning schemes that you can legally engage in to reduce your tax, tax liabilities. Planning. Wow. But of course, the biggest aspect of tax liabilities is normally the penalties that we suffer because of non-compliance. Once you fail to file your returns, URA is going to estimate you, and the URA estimates are normally not small. Now, on top of that, there are penalties that are imposed, and there is interest that is charged for any tax that was due but was not paid. Whoa. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for Mr. Joseph Okuja? for educating us in such a short time. And I'm seeing so many questions coming through per saying, please share his number, my friend. No, you're not going to get his number. You can buy the book, okay? It is available at a restock for what is honestly considerably a very low amount of money compared to what you will pay if you're not compliant. And you can also find him at Libra Advocates and Consultants. He's the team leader there. You will pay some Kamane to get the information. All right. But right now, I'd like us to welcome Mr. Chris Kawesa, who is also the leader of Business Garage here. He has like a minute to say something and just sort of, you know, put this thing together. Chris, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you, Pastor B3. Mm. Thank you, Pastor B3. OJ, <laughs> you have really blessed us. But most of all, I feel like we've done nothing. Yes. We've done nothing. We, we've, fin we've closed the table of contents. Yeah. And please allow us to call you back Again, for please. several sessions because we have just scratched the surface. So thank you so much, uh, OJ. Uh, just to lean in some, into something small, uh, we're in business garage, and some people may not understand that actually paying taxes is biblical. Oh. Yeah? So it's important to pay taxes. It's biblical. Uh, there are verses that... that uh, talk about it. I'll not read them, but I'll just tell you which ones. You can read um, you can read uh, Luke 20, 23 to 25. You can read Matthew 17, 24 to 27 and many others. But paying taxes is biblical yeah. and uh, God has asked us to pay taxes. It's a form of honor. We're doing honor and I think it's a form of honor. Uh, the reason why some of us are not called to government, to discuss government issues because 
we don't pay or we pay little tax. Oh. The people who are invited to the tables to discuss national matters are the guys who pay a lot of tax. tax. So we need to build businesses to pay tax. But also to lean into uh, the, the issue of taxes, uh, when you do business, you employ people. Yes. And also, you, then you can, they can pay taxes and also you pay income tax to support the government with the works that they are doing. Uh, OJ, I think you can tell us, if government can't cover its budget, what happens? Of course, um, government has its major source of income as tax revenues. And that is what makes any country sovereign. You cannot claim to be sovereign or independent if you cannot generate internal revenues that can be able to finance the various expenditures that government incurs. So where there is a shortfall in tax revenues, government is going to borrow either from internal sources or from external sources. Now, where they are not able to borrow, they receive donations or grants. So there are very many international, public international organizations that give donations and grants to government, and uh, that is what government relies on for purposes of financing the annual budget. So it is tax revenues, donations and grants, and then borrowings, both internal and external. Mm. Yes. So friends, your non-compliance is keeping us in bondage. Ouch. Uh, Ugandan taxpayers, individuals, about 1.4 million people only, and about 120,000 companies. We are about, I think about 10 million people are employed in Uganda, and a population of about 40 million. So a percentage of about, what percentage is that? Of three percent or four that is carrying the burden of the country because we are not paying taxes yeah so our compliance to taxes is going to get us out of bondage yes. and this is biblical and i think that's what that's why god wants us to support government in doing whatever they have to do for us we can claim corruption and all that but honor is not a factor of the person you're honoring oh, yeah. it is yours yeah. so let us honor government with our taxes so that we get out of bondage, bondage. Pastor B3, wow, please. what a way to close this. So if you're not compliant, you know what to do. Get compliant and let's get this nation out of bondage into sovereignty because today is even Independence Day was yesterday. We are celebrating Uganda. Celebrate your nation by participating. It was yesterday but one, but you know what I mean. It's Independence Weekend. So get compliant again thank you so much oj for coming here and educating us guys please buy this book and let's get compliant god bless you right now we'll be getting into the children's church in about two minutes kids garage is coming on online thank you for joining us Con share this content with friends and family and let's honor our nation god bless goodbye can i say something before we close yes he said that uh, paying taxes is biblical Yes, it is biblical. Give unto Caesar what belongs, what belongs to Caesar. To Caesar. Mm. But I want to add that Caesar is only entitled to what belongs to Caesar. Do not donate more than what you are supposed to donate. So tax is a creature of law, and you are expected to pay only the correct amount of tax. And you can only pay the correct amount of tax if you are compliant. Now, if you fail to comply, you are going to pay extra because there are estimated assessments, there are penalties, and there is interest that you are going to suffer. So in order to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, please comply by, filing, by registering for taxes, by filing your returns by the due date, by paying your taxes by the due date. If you fail to do any of those, then you'll be paying more to Caesar than what you're actually expected to pay. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> wow.